Here's the specific details on how I migrated a large code base that started in 2015 using Windows and .NET Framework to current day 2024, nine years later, using the latest .NET 8 on Linux in containers. But hang on, if you're not in the .NET space, I still think there's strategies that you can apply regardless of the platform or language that you're using to keep your code base up to date. So at a very high level, this code base is using the WebQ worker pattern. So we have an HTTP API in a worker that's a unified code base using the exact same code. They're just two separate processes and they're both scaled out independently. So we have in this particular case, maybe three instances of our HTTP API behind a load balancer. We have clients connecting to that. We have workers which are really just interacting with a queue and performing work asynchronously. And they're both interacting with the same database. And all this was in .NET Framework on Windows. Before I go any further, I'd like to thank EventStore for sponsoring this video. EventStoreDB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. Our HTTP APIs, or web APIs, were using Owen and Katana on .NET Framework. And this really was kind of the precursor to what is ASP.NET Core today. If you have any history, or maybe this is really just a history lesson, this is kind of seems like to me is the precursor to it because a lot of the interactions, how you do with the startup to find all your middleware is very similar to what it was in Katana to what it is today. And while we did have some web API controllers, the majority of the system and the vast, vast majority of the routes that we had were using Nancy. To go from .NET Framework on Windows to current day .NET on Linux required an intermediate step. The naming and versions is very confusing during this time, during this migration. But to clarify, we're talking about .NET Framework, say 4.8 on Windows and Windows only. Then Microsoft released .NET Core 1, as well as 2.1, which is gonna be significant, and that could run on Linux. And that's completely separate than .NET Framework. .NET Core, at that point, after version three, there was no four, got rebranded to just being called .NET. So then it turned to .NET 5, and now we're at .NET 8. And an important part of this history lesson is understanding .NET standard. The super simplified version of that I would like to explain this is you can think of .NET Framework and .NET Core because they're completely different. They're different implementations of .NET. Then there's .NET standard, which you can think of like as an interface, which those two implement or parts of it implement. So if you wanna look at a library that you know is gonna work on .NET Framework and .NET Core or .NET what it is today, and it's .NET Standard, it will work on both. So that intermediate step that I mentioned is about .NET Standard. And the idea is that our entire code base and our dependencies, if they were .NET Standard compliant, that means that I could build our code base and run it under .NET Framework 4.8, or I could run it under .NET Core 2.1 at the time. So for example, because I mentioned we were using Nancy, when they released this in 2019, their point of this was to support .NET Standard, which I needed. So I was upgrading to this, but along with this upgrade to 2.0 came some breaking changes. So depending on the size of your code base, you may be able just to deal with those breaking changes, fix your code, no problem. However, if you have a very large code base and it depends on something like this, like a framework, that may be a lot more difficult. And the suggestion here, which I do this quite often, is to create a shim. So this is some of the code that we're looking at. This is how this worked in Nancy, basically 1x, where this is how you defined, defined routes and their values. So I'm just in a Nancy module, and you can see I have a route called just, this is a named route, I just gave it the name. Um, and then here's a path, which is called sync, because this was synchronous, not an asynchronous call. Same type of route here. I just have a different one that's not named. And then all of a sudden I have these other two, and this is how you did async calls. The named method, the path, and you specified true here that it was going to be async. And then I'm just calling this function over here, do async. Same type of thing. Exactly, the, but these were the two different ways that you defined routes in Nancy 1.x. But after upgrading to version 2.0 of Nancy, here's the problem, these are the breaking changes. This is how you now define routes using various methods of get, post, put, etc. Rather than this dictionary, none of this works. And I had so many routes to actually manually go over these was gonna be very comparable, just tedious. So the option here was creating a shim, which I did. So I created a Nancy v1 module. And when I did that, really what I was doing, I was making everything existing backwards compatible that just called everything from the old way that was done to the new way. 
And as you can see, I don't need to get into the weeds of this, but this is just rebuilding everything, which was this Nancy V1 route builder that I had for all the different methods that were callable. And I just basically am re-implementing everything, but calling the appropriate way that's in version two. In terms of tooling to figure out what packages are available in .NET Standard, what works in .NET Core or .NET 8 now, there's two tools you can use. One is from AWS, which is their porting assistant. You can give this a try. As well as back in the day, there used to be the .NET Portability Analyzer, but that's been deprecated and now it's really called the .NET Upgrade Assistant. So basically be looking at these two tools to help you in your migration. But regardless, you're still gonna run into what I pointed out earlier with things like breaking changes, or maybe there's a library that you are using, a NuGet package that isn't even supported. So what do you do then? There's really three types of options that I've used. The first is trying to find somebody that's forked that package that's not supporting .NET standard and they've adapted to .NET standard if it's open source and then you can use that as the alternative. And then it's just like a drop-in replacement. The second option is do it yourself. If you can, if you're available to do that based on licensing, fork it and you uh, update it accordingly so it works in .NET standard or .NET core, .NET 5 plus. The third option is just try to find another library that does the similar type of thing that is supported. And then based on that, you're either gonna have to change, like obviously you're gonna have to change your own code because the API is completely different and that may be feasible, but if it's not feasible because you have so much usage, so much coupling to that dependency, you may try to do a similar type of thing and try to create some adapter so it looks like the existing API of that old package, but then is routed to all the new APIs for whatever new library you're using. Once I got the entire code base working on .NET Standard, my own code, all my libraries, ultimately I could do this. I could build and run multiple instances behind our load balancer, run our existing code base exactly the way it was on Windows in .NET Framework, but I also built separately, still running on Windows, but running on .NET Core 2.1. So, and that's because that exact same code base can run on both, and that was the purpose. So that way you can tell if there's any runtime differences, because it's very difficult to test. The only thing I will mention about runtime differences are maybe serialization, those types of things you might have to pay attention to. Same type of thing with the worker there, two different instances, there could be many, just slowly plugging in multiple instances of that are now running on .NET Core 2.1 at that time. So if everything's running fine at that point, you really kind of are almost home free. The next real step in this is just whether you decide to upgrade to .NET Core 3.1, check any breaking changes, and then keep going along the steps all the way to .NET 5, 6 to 8, all the way to today, that can be the thing. You could probably even go from 2.1 all the way to 8, because I don't think there's that many breaking changes that I remember along the way. But the biggest thing is that once you can get it to run on .NET Core 2.1, you're pretty much there. A couple nuanced things that may or may not apply to you is I mentioned serialization, and when I was using JSON.NET, Newtonsoft, when I was serializing that in .NET Framework and then trying to deserialize it in .NET Core because that type information was there from BCL stuff, that was having issues. Another thing that I ran into, but I don't think many people did because I didn't really ever hear much about it, was multi-targeting, where I was using a NuGet package that was targeting, say, .NET Standard that I'd be using when I was using .NET Core, .NET 8 now, but also was targeting something like .NET Framework 4.8, and because of its multi-targeting and condition if defs in how it was building, the actual API service was different. My exact example was AWS's S3 SDK. That was a different API, even though it was the exact same version. They removed all the synchronous methods from it um, in the .NET standard version. So I did have issues with that. Whether you run into that, I'm not sure. I understand this is a massive undertaking for people with a large code base running on .NET Framework that are trying to migrate off to .NET 8 as it is today. Hopefully this 10 minute video I realize isn't gonna solve all life's problems here and give you all the insights, but at least you get some of the gist of what I did and the steps I took, because it wasn't a big bang. It was a slow migration. It was kind of a path of updating my code, updating packages, getting something to run on both .NET Framework and .NET Core before we could continue on. So hopefully give you some insights and let me know in the comments how you've done your migration if you're in the middle of one, because I'd love to hear about it. And if you want to get involved more, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can chat with other software developers about software architecture design, topics like this, CQRS, event sourcing, domain-driven design, and more. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up 
If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.